So we are happy to welcome today Jake Quizzy, who trained as a zoologist at the University of London before gaining a master's degree in applied animal behavior and animal welfare science at the University of Edinburgh. He's, uh, he then um, defended a doctorate in behavioral ecology at the University of Glasgow. And for over two decades, he has been held executive roles within some of the largest zoo and aquarium facilities in Europe and North America. And he has been an active member for the IUCN for many years. Jake uh, regularly advises zoos, wildlife parks, and sanctuary on business development, facility design, and master planning, as well as governmental and non-governmental agencies on conservation and animal welfare policy. Jake is particularly interested in the interface between conservation and animal welfare science, and is equally passionate about both. Today, his uh, webinar is entitled Animal Welfare, Threat or Opportunity to Zoos and Aquarium. So thank you again, Jake, for joining. I will stop sharing my screen so that you can uh, share your presentation. And please remember to turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Thank you. Perfect. So good, good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning, good evening, depending on, uh, good afternoon, in fact, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thanks for the introduction. And Sally, thanks for your very impressive impression of a Dalek. We uh, uh, really appreciate that. Um, so, um, as uh, Sandrine said, I want to talk about animal welfare as both a, a, a threat and uh, an opportunity. I very much see it as an opportunity uh, to the sector, but I know it can be perceived uh, as a threat for, for fairly obvious reasons. And I want to explain why I think it's actually an exciting opportunity and it's something that we should feel positive and optimistic about. Um, as, as Sandri mentioned, <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to work on uh, three continents uh, within the zoo and aquarium sector, and I've experienced three very different perspectives on animal welfare. So you, you're going to have to indulge me a, li a little bit because I'm going to spend a little bit of time uh, discussing some conceptions of welfare, often with conferences and research papers. Um, we launch straight into discussions about welfare without actually being particularly clear about what we mean by it. And I think it's worth spending a little bit of time talking about what welfare is uh, because our conceptions of welfare have a profound impact upon how we approach welfare and ultimately how animals uh, experience it. I'm then going to move on and provide uh, a, a couple of tools that I've used. Uh, to improve uh, welfare, both on an institutional level and an individual facility level, uh, that hopefully are going to help take us beyond uh, best practice. Um, but I want to start by very briefly considering a, a snapshot of where we are in terms of welfare, in terms of uh, public perceptions uh, of welfare. Now, unfortunately, this data is only from the AZA region, uh, but it's quite interesting nonetheless. And it shows that within <coughs> visitors to AZA zoos, um, only 46% of people that are actually visiting uh, an AZA facility think that the animals in that facility uh, are happy. And in fact, as much as a third of the visitors to Canadian zoos, and these are, again, please be aware, these are people who are actually at the facilities, who are actively visiting the facilities. A third of people who are visiting uh, Canadian uh, zoos think the animals are unhappy. And those percentages are obviously likely to be greater amongst that cohort of people who aren't uh, visiting zoos. And amongst uh, zoo, uh, uh, amongst animal uh, uh, agencies and zoo and accrediting agencies, uh, zoos are actually less trusted uh, than PETA. 
and uh, we have a, a lower favorability rating uh, than museums and sanctuaries, which uh, to some degree is baffling. You know, we, here we are trying to save the planet um, as opposed to uh, museums uh, which are saving artifacts and, and, and sharing educational message about those and sanctuaries that are doing valuable work saving individual animals, but not necessarily uh, saving species. So the fact that we have less favorable ratings, I think uh, we, we can, own, I, I certainly uh, make the, the conclusion that that links to uh, uh, unfavorable ability in terms of, uh, you know, uh, welfare perceptions. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, there's enough evidence out there to show that if we are perceived to get welfare wrong, um, we're going to be in trouble as an institution. Um, it's going to impact us financially, it can um, bring institutions down. But I also believe um, it has an impact on our capacity uh, to, to, uh, to maximize our, our conservation potential. Now, in, in my lifetime, there's been a 60% decline in wildlife globally. We're looking at a million species uh, at risk of extinction. And certainly the zoo programs um, uh, the establishment of new species within zoos has not kept pace uh, with the demand that this decline in, in wildlife uh, uh, has created. Now, inevitably, zoos are not necessarily the solution to that problem, but we are certainly uh, a very important part of that toolkit. And within Canada, roughly two thirds of species uh, vertebrate species conservation strategies, for example, involve uh, captive breeding. So we are an integral component to that conservation toolkit, and increasingly so, but we've definitely not kept track with the, the pace of decline in nature. Um, <clears throat> So, and, and as an example of that, in 1992, I attended uh, a, a, a conference at the Zoological Society of London on uh, marine mammals. And there was a presentation given on the vaquita and the conservation issues uh, that that species was facing. And at that, that time, there were a thousand vaquita left in the wild. And the, the scientists presenting there uh, advocated strongly that we needed to establish uh, a captive breeding program for this very enigmatic and, you know, very small marine mammal. But an attempt to establish a captive breeding program for this species that would no doubt be popular within zoos would hopefully be manageable because of its scale and one in which we could have actually had a, a tangible impact upon the conservation of this species wasn't initiated until 2017, uh, at which point the population in the wild had, had fallen to uh, less than a dozen and inevitably um, it, it was far too late. And I can only assume that the reluctance to take on that opportunity of bringing that new species in can only be uh, as a result of the potential backlash the, uh, those agencies that, that would have brought that about would have faced uh, in terms of concerns uh, uh, over welfare. So I think the, the reservations that are out there within our public, even within people who visit us, um, we can see that the concerns over welfare uh, can be quite mind, uh, uh, widespread. They have the potential to damage our operations and actually can pose an existential threat to our existence. But they also hold back our programs in terms of uh, conservation programming. But I also think our failure to, to win uh, the, 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 the public um, uh, debate in terms of welfare is gonna impact uh, our capacity to, to reach uh, and, and connect with the public. And to, to, to illustrate that point, I want to briefly go into sort of discussing some of the nuances 
uh, the similarities and the differences between um, animal welfare uh, and, and, and conservation. So animal welfare is very much about the experiences of individual animals uh, in, in the here and now. And that creates a public, uh, uh, the public have an emotional and empathetic connection with that. They, they have an emotional connection with the uh, experiences of individual animals. In contrast, conservation is very much about safeguarding populations ecosystems, ecosystem services, and, and functions for, for future generations. And it's a far more um, intellectual uh, conservation, uh, uh, conversation uh, and debate. And I think that's reflected in how the pub public engage uh, with these two contrasting narratives. And I think that's reflected uh, that the, 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 that the nature of that engagement is reflected um, in the, the, the relative income streams uh, for agencies that are active in, in uh, either area. So these are, uh, I, I picked these as, as arguably the, the highest profile animal welfare and conservation agencies within uh, Canada in the UK and compared their, their income streams. So for the, uh, the SPCAs, the Societies for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals across Canada, uh, on an annual basis they generate in the region of uh, $140 million in contrast to the $16 million that WWF uh, Canada generate uh, across the, the, the whole country and let's let's not forget that Canada is the second biggest country on the planet with uh, a, a lot of nature uh, uh, for, for, uh, to conserve and similarly in the UK uh, the RSPCA's capacity to generate revenue uh, dwarfs that of, of WWF UK and um, you know, to give further illustrations, the donkey sanctuary in the UK generates $38 million a year in contrast, Save the Rhino International uh, uh, generates just $1.7 million, despite the fact it's trying to save five very enigmatic uh, and very popular uh, uh, species. And that's because I think the, the, this emotional connection that people have with the well-being of individual animals is a more powerful motivator and engages people uh, more effectively than, than we are currently doing in regards to conservation. And I think that's also reflected in the media. Certainly the death of a single giraffe uh, um, at the Copenhagen Zoo, Marius, uh, attracted far more uh, attention uh, in the international media than the extinction of the Saudi gazelle uh, just a few years uh, uh, previous uh, to that. So how can we capitalize on this? How can we harness that uh, emotional uh, connection people have with the welfare uh, uh, of individual animals to uh, deliver um, uh, on, on our conservation mandate? And this is where I think there's, there's huge room for optimism because I think zoos and aquariums are uniquely placed to do exa exactly that. I think we should view uh, conservation as a welfare issue. There's not a single conservation challenge uh, that doesn't involve suffering. So if we consider shark thinning or the catastrophic decline uh, in orangutan populations, all, all of these sort of involve uh, immense suffering uh, on, on a almost in, in, in in industrial scale and I think because we hold individual animals that we can create um, uh, connections with, with with the public we have an op a unique opportunity to leverage that uh, to, um, uh, uh, to to harness that emotional connection um, people have with the welfare of individual animals and, and help translate that in, into conservation action. And to do that, we need to consider occupying that interface uh, between um, animal welfare uh, and, and conservation. Um, but in order to do that, we need to be seen to be effective in securing welfare. We can't 
uh, legitimately advocate for or educate people about uh, uh, saving species if we can't be seen uh, to take care uh, of individual animals. So to have this firm foundation for this uh, approach of trying to occupy that niche, we need to be uh, uh, on, on firm ground in, in regards to our capacity to, to deliver uh, uh, good animal welfare. And I think we failed to realize that potential in recent years. Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's a number of, uh, uh, of reasons why. And I think for, for those of us who work in the sector, when we share with people we meet that we work within the, the zoo and aquarium sector, you know, I, I, certainly from personal experience, there's always a significant proportion of the public, uh, of people we meet, who have that, you know, slight concern, you know, it's not an obviously good thing to be doing uh, for, for all people. So we're, we're failing to win that argument uh, across the spectrum. And I think it's really important uh, that we get better at that, not just because it's important uh, to us as institutions, but it's actually really important to our, to our conservation uh, mission. So very briefly, I'd like to kind of consider why we may not uh, be fulfilling our potential uh, in, in that area. And I think there are three principal reasons. The first and the most obvious is we're not as good as maybe even perhaps we think we are, but we're certainly not as good uh, as we can be. And I've picked these two photos deliberately they're from the same facility, they're a century apart, and uh, um, they're for, you know, essentially uh, uh, big cats in the same facility, uh, 100 years apart. And whilst we've made um, uh, uh, progress in terms of the aesthetics uh, of these displays, I think um, I'm less confident that we've made uh, a, a, a fundamental quantum leap in terms of our capacity uh, to deliver welfare uh, within these two facilities. And if we consider the advances made uh, across many other sectors, I think we still have uh, a, a lot of room for improvement. I think too frequently the industry perceives welfare as a threat rather than an opportunity. And what that results in is we tend to defend the status quo. We tend to defend what we're currently doing because we perceive it as a threat. And this uh, and prevents us from pushing the boundaries and also encourages us to be uh, secretive about our, our shortcomings. And that lack of transparency undermines <clears throat> the, the trust the public have uh, within us, as we, we've seen from the AZA survey, uh, in, in our capacity and our, our desire uh, to, to safeguard welfare. And, and certainly based on personal experience, I think the public are very tolerant of our commitments to improve on shortcomings uh, if we are honest about them, but are very intolerant if we deny or, or defend our shortcomings. And I think the third reason is there's likely a discrepancy between how we conceive welfare, uh, by uh, how animals experience it, and also how uh, the, the public uh, perceive it. I think we choose conceptions of welfare that either accidentally or deliberately flatter us, but aren't necessarily um, optimal for, for improving welfare. And I actually think the public have a greater understanding of that uh, than we might think, as I'm going to ho hopefully share with you later on in this, uh, this presentation. So I want to briefly consider uh, how we conceive welfare, because as, as I've said here, I think it's a fundamental uh, element to why we might not be uh, achieving uh, uh, our, our, our full potential in terms of welfare delivery. So here we have four um, definitions of welfare. And what I've done here is I've highlighted those aspects of welfare that relate to physical well-being in red, 
and those aspects that relate to psychological well-being in green. So you don't necessarily have to read all of these, but just to get to get the overall picture that uh, uh, between IAZA, WAZA, AZA, and the, the Universal Declaration of Animal Welfare, there, there's a fairly consistent blend of physical and psychological. Uh, components being uh, fundamental to uh, the, the, the essence and the nature of animal welfare. Now, this is entirely reasonable. Uh, it, it, it makes absolute sense, but I do believe that it has problematic um, outcomes. And I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit later on. But before I move on from that, I want to talk to you about uh, my personal uh, conceptions uh, of animal welfare because whilst they are, are similar to this they're not exactly the same as this. So as you've seen most of these definitions uh, combine physical and psychological uh, elements but my, my personal take on animal welfare is it all boils down to the feelings of animals. Health is obviously important it does impact the feelings of animals but if it doesn't impact it can impact the feelings of animals but if health doesn't impact the feelings of animals it doesn't impact welfare so for example if an animal has an asymptomatic disease that is not impacting its behavior or how it feels at that moment in time it's not impacting uh, uh, its welfare now the unfortunate thing is we can't measure the feelings of animals uh, directly um, they, we don't share a common language, they can't tell us how they feel, uh, and as a result, we are reliant upon imperfect and indirect indicators <clears throat> from which we make welfare inferences, and, and, and all of these have, have challenges associated with them. So abnormal behaviours can be expressed uh, outside of stressful situations if animals learn uh, in inverted commas, if, if animals go for a stressful period and develop stereotypies, for example, those behaviours can be, become manifest throughout life, even once those stressful situations uh, are, are removed. So-called stress hormones uh, can be uh, depressed in animals that are un, uh, subject to chronic stress, and they become uh, they can become elevated and animals are, are experiencing positive excitement or different uh, stages of their, 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 their breeding season, uh, etc. And physiological indicators of, of welfare um, can have other causes and it's very difficult often to determine causal relationships between uh, reductions in, in uh, physiological metrics of welfare and, um, uh, and, and, and the causal factors. Um, in contrast, health has lots of very tangible met metrics. We can measure population and individual level, uh, uh, level longevity, how, animals, uh, how long animals live, how their reproductive success, if animal, you know, you'll hear it time and time again, they must be happy because they're breeding. I, I would hope uh, the, the nonsense of that uh, statement uh, is evident in the agricultural sector uh, uh, and, and factory farming. We, and again, similarly, body condition, just because an animal is in good physical condition uh, doesn't necessarily mean uh, that its welfare is good. And again, I would refer you back to the agricultural sector, which is all about, you know, growing uh, body uh, mass and condition for, for consumption uh, and so that is absolutely a, a goal of agriculture but it certainly is not necessarily that goal is not necessarily compatible with good psychological uh, uh, well-being and even the extent to which we provide health care the number of vets the size of our, our vet hospital etc can all be seen as tangible metrics in terms of our commitment uh, to welfare. And there is very much an intuitive link between health and welfare, and it's emerged as a result of all of this, its tangibility and that intuitive link, 
uh, as, as one of the most influential factors in relation to welfare. Um, but health uh, is not the same as welfare. And if we manage animals uh, with too much emphasis uh, on, on health, it, it can actually come into to conflict of welfare. And I now want to give you a couple of examples of, of where I feel that, that's happened. So the American Veterinary Medical Association, which is the uh, uh, umbrella organization, which uh, uh, all US-based vet, vets and, and indeed many North American vets uh, are, are members of, uh, the UK government, the European Union, and the Australian government have all reviewed the welfare of uh, sows in stalls. And whilst the, the UK and the EU uh, reviews subsequent to the UK's reviews concluded that sow stalls called serious welfare problems and as a result implemented bans. Uh, these, uh, those assessments were based on holistic conceptions of welfare that included a consideration for the effective states uh, of those sows. Oh. In contrast, the uh, American Veterinary Medical Association and the Australian uh, government's reviews concluded that the same sow stalls actually protected welfare. And that's because they looked at welfare in, uh, in relation to disease prevalence, injury, immunology, growth rates, and nitrogen balance. And actually the American Veterinary Medical Association opposed the California uh, state's Farm Animal Welfare Act which required uh, agricultural animals have the freedom uh, as a minimum to stand up and turn around. And it, it, it still astonishes me every time I, I share this fact that uh, the American Veterinary Medical Association opposed legislation uh, requiring animals have the freedom uh, to stand up and turn around on welfare grounds. Um, Again, it's, it's hard for me to imagine how uh, this conclusion uh, can be reached, but I can only uh, conclude it is a result of this greater emphasis on the physical versus the psychological uh, and the fact that that preference potentially has its roots uh, in the increased measurability of physical aspects in relation to welfare uh, versus um, uh, the, the psychological aspects. I, I would not suggest for a minute that it's collusion between the agricultural sector and the, the, uh, uh, the assessment uh, uh, process there. But anyway, I'll, I'll, I won't even go there. Um, so if, if science can't agree on um, conceptions uh, of welfare, it's, it's perhaps understandable why we are not necessarily consistent across the spectrum uh, within the zoo and aquarium sector and that there, are, there is some uh, confusion as to, as to how we approach welfare and certainly there, there is variation uh, across the, the three continents that, that, that I've worked in. But it's very clear that how we conceive welfare, how we measure up welfare, has a profound impact upon how we subsequently manage animals and the, ultimately how those animals experience the, the world. So uh, hopefully the, the example with relation to, to pigs and agriculture illustrate that point. But I, I wanna give a, a very, I believe, tangible example from uh, the zoo sector for one of our more iconic species. Now, it's, it's widely accepted that health is a foundation of good welfare and uh, nutrition is a foundation of good health. It's, it's the first of the, you know, providing uh, appropriate nutrition. It's the first of the five freedoms and it's the first uh, 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 leg of the, the, the five domains, it's the first domain of the five domains models. And as a result of this intuitive link between um, uh, nutrition and physical well-being and physical well-being and welfare, 
the Association of American Association of Zoo Veterinarians uh, uh, in their guidelines state whenever possible the use of species specific commercially prepared animal diets um, should be utilized as the basis of any nutritional program. All of this follows a very logical chain. Uh, if physical health is good for welfare and nutrition is good for physical health, then we want to have the best quality diets. And the only way that we can provide for the best quality diets are those that we can, we can regulate, we can control, we can monitor, uh, we can measure, and we can provide a perfect nutrient balance, et cetera, uh, and, and consistency on a, a, a daily basis. All of this uh, seems relatively innocuous and, and makes logical sense. But it potentially has <clears throat> profound consequences for, for, for both health and, and welfare. And I want to illustrate that point in relation to one of the most iconic species we, we keep within zoos and, and that of, of the tiger. Now, this is a very quick snapshot, a summary of the, the feeding ecology of a tiger in the wild. And what's, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that the acquisition of food for a tiger is so much more than hunting. It's so much more than chasing an animal and killing it and eating it. The tiger has to maintain a territory. Uh, it has to understand the prey density within that territory. The territories uh, across the tiger species and uh, across the different subspecies range from as little as 16 square, uh, square kilometers in uh, the Sundarbans uh, in the Indian subcontinent where prey density is higher all the way up to two and a half thousand square kilometers uh, in the, the Russian Far East for Siberian or, or, or Amur tigers. So the scale of that territory is uh, very much shaped by the, the capacity of, the, the, of that habitat to support those tigers. So they have to understand prey density, they have to defend a territory that is capable of sustaining them. And to do that, they need to understand who is active within that territory, they have to mark that territory, they have to defend that territory when necessary. And that whole information gathering and territory defense takes up a substantial part of the, the lifestyle uh, of a tiger in the wild. And that is the foundation of their food acquisition process before we even enter into the, uh, the, those aspects relating to foraging. But, so then we'll move on to the appetite phase the tiger needs to know where the prey are. It needs to get itself into a position where it can uh, uh, ambush that prey, ultimately chase that, that individual, uh, kill that individual, process the carcass, and then consume uh, a meal, which uh, might be up to 20% of the tiger's body weight in any one single sitting. And this is a really important point. Uh, tigers in the wild are not fed daily, they do not feed daily, they feed intermittently and they tend to gorge. And it's, the, it's actually the stomach distension of the tiger that shuts down the motivation to forage. So they kill the carcass, they process that carcass, they consume that large meal, and it's the, that full belly, that stomach distension that is, is the, the the trigger to shut down that motivation to go out uh, look, looking for, for, for more food. Now, in contrast in zoos, when we start with uh, commercially prepared animal diets as the foundation for how we're gonna manage this, uh, this species in captivity, it leads uh, to the, the sorry state of affairs that is, is quite prevalent, certainly within many North American institutions, where tigers are fed a processed chow diet on a daily basis. Uh, they come in packets tailored to meet the, the, the daily nutritional 
requirements of a, a big cat. Um, very little consideration for the broad spectrum of affective behaviors um, uh, re related to the acquisition of food uh, for tigers. <clears throat> and as a result, we see a very high incidence of stereotypies uh, uh, amongst this group. And uh, we even attempt to make, um, uh, turn that into an asset by designing habitats that actually uh, allow tigers to effectively stereotype in more imaginative ways uh, um, uh, to, to, to support uh, public display. And crucially, what this diet does with these small daily meals, it might de you know, it, it might de-risk the carcass feeding. It's unlikely to get parasites from this. It's unlikely to chew, uh, to choke on a bone, etc. All of these risks, hypothetical risks associated with carcass feeding, are, are obviously eliminated. But the scale and and the, the quantities of food provided prevents these tigers from ever experiencing the full stomach distension they have evolved to experience. And so they are chronically motivated to go seeking food. They never reach the species appropriate levels of satiety that is required to shut down that motivation to forage. And so we keep them in, a, in an environment in which they are prevented from foraging by the lack of foraging opportunities and we set them up physiologically to be chronically motivated to forage. And so we set these animals up to be chronically frustrated uh, based on, on uh, the, the, the uh, prioritization of the nutritional program. So there is this disconnect between, uh, often there is this disconnect between uh, physical and, and psychological uh, priorities uh, and that's its impact on welfare. And I believe that's very much reflected uh, in, in husbandry guidelines and best practice. Uh, and, and to illustrate that here, again, I'm using the same colors. Those aspects related to physical well-being are highlighted in red. Those related to uh, uh, psychological well-being, such as the social uh, environment of the, of the species or, or narrative relating uh, to the species behavioral ecology in the wild is, is highlighted green. Um, and, and just 16% of uh, a review of the AZA husbandry guidelines undertaken in, in 2017 related to uh, the psychological well-being. So I actually don't think the best practice as we know and conceive it uh, uh, at the moment is actually that great. And um, this is a, just a very quick snapshot of a, of a paper that's in prep at the moment um, where we've undertaken an assessment of the uh, psychological needs of, of tigers in captivity. And we uh, discovered that foraging was the most important behavior for these tigers, uh, uh, more important than uh, the aspects related to killing and chasing prey, uh, but carcass processing were, was equally important. Uh, and again, uh, there's no opportunity for carcass processing, processing with these chow-based diets. And we do attempt to replicate stalking and, and uh, uh, prey acquisition behaviors. It accounts for 79% uh, of behavioral enrichment strategies for, for, for big cats. Um, but what we don't uh, uh, do successfully at the moment is acknowledge and uh, address the issue of foraging uh, for tigers and their, their, their desire, their innate desire and, and need to go out into their environment and gather uh, in, in information. And, and, and we need uh, to get better at that. So I think it's very clear that we've undergone a welfare journey. We are evolving our capacity to deliver welfare. But that journey is very much still ongoing. You know, let's not be complacent about where, where we're at. And I just now very want to consider 
that welfare journey for two quite iconic species that had similar concerns raised about them, um, but which ultimately underwent two very different uh, journeys in terms of, of, of welfare. I believe as a result of how the industry reacted to ultimately similar concerns. Now, um, I'm assuming uh, many of you will be familiar with this uh, uh, graphic. It's about uh, the, the evolution of zoos. Uh, and it was produced by Rab in 92. And welfare has been a really important part of that evolution. So I'm gonna use this model to, to illustrate the, 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 the timeline and, and the journey for two uh, very interesting uh, species in two uh, different regions. The first are uh, orca within North America. Now prior to killer whales, orca being kept in captivity in pre-European times, they were revered by indigenous communities. They were seen as symbolic of the family because of their, their close uh, family unit. Um, and when the Europeans arrived, they were feared and despised. They were seen as competition with farmers. And in fact, governments in, in the Americas uh, provided bounties for people to, to kill killer whales. And all, even up until the, the 60s off the coast of BC, uh, there were uh, high powered machine guns uh, placed in locations uh, for, for guys to, to uh, kill these killer, killer whales and, and receive the bounty. Now, in 1964, the Vancouver Aquarium wanted to establish a killer whale display. Uh, it wasn't actually, they didn't want to capture a, a live killer whale and, and bring it into the aquarium but they wanted to have like a museum type display in the aquarium uh, and, and, and display the, 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 the skeleton of the killer whale. So quite happily, they went out, um, hired someone to go out and harpoon a killer whale. Um, and again, completely uncontroversial at the time. And amazingly, it took three months for this killer whale to die. The killer whale uh, was harpooned, it was not killed, it was towed back uh, to the harbour in Vancouver and it, it received a huge amount of public interest. 20,000 people turned up in the pouring rain over the course of the three months uh, that that killer whale was slowly dying in the harbour just to see it. And that led to the, um, you know, if people are going to come and see a dying killer whale, imagine what they would do to, to come and see a live killer whale. And that essentially uh, started the commercial capture uh, of killer whale uh, within North America that were, um, and, and that spread beyond the borders uh, uh, of the Americas. And that actually triggered it was the start of a change in perception for the killer whale. So the founders of Greenpeace and Sea Shepherd on seeing this killer whale at the Vancouver Aquarium became motivated to save marine mammals. It wasn't part of the political agenda at the time. And in fact, when the executive director of the BCSPCA um, lobbied the fisheries minister to to stop the, you know, the, the barbaric uh, keeping of, of killer whales. Uh, um, he, was, he was ridiculed at the time. But the keeping of these subsequently captured killer whales started that process of, of changing public opinion. And to the point that they were widely kept um, uh, in, in North America. Interestingly, back over the pond in the UK, concerns were emerging about the welfare of cetaceans in captivity and the government working with the industry and with science, scientists developed best practice guidelines. The, um, the, the, the UK zoo and aquarium community uh, acknowledged they would not be able to meet and effectively the last cetacean uh, kept in, in the UK uh, was actually um, um, removed from captivity and released to the wild uh, um, in, in the very early 90s. Uh, uh, but it's, despite the fact we've not had cetaceans in the UK for three decades, they're not actually 
be banned, but there are guidelines in place that have effectively prevented uh, the industry from doing that. So um, during the 90s, it was widely accepted within the Americas. Even with the Free Willy movie, it was still widely accepted and popular. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, the Vancouver Aquarium exported its last killer whale. It previously committed not to capture any uh, wild killer whales. And it was actually, um, it was met with disappointment from the local community. Even at that time, there was very little <coughs> concerns about the well-being of killer whales in, in captivity. And then uh, we move forward a decade. Uh, Russia starts getting into the business of commercially capturing killer whales. Uh, but in the same year, uh, Blackfish was released. Uh, following uh, the, the movie Blackfish, the public awareness of concerns over I issues relating to the ethics of keeping uh, well, uh, orca in captivity exploded. Uh, sea World visitation uh, collapsed uh, and ultimately brought that organization down. It's now changed hands. Um, and legislation against the keeping of captive orca started cropping up in various um, uh, jurisdictions across the planet to the point that cita keeping cetaceans in captivity in Canada is now illegal. And even in Russia um, has uh, announced um, that it will release, has, will release all its uh, orcas kept in the so-called whale gel. So there's a trajectory there from people not caring at all to the zoo and aquarium sector, bringing these animals into captivity, which got people to care about them and ultimately led uh, to it, uh, the social license for keeping that species in captivity being lost. Um, and I now want to compare that with, in, in some respects, uh, a similar species, that of the polar bear, it's also a large, wide-ranging uh, animal that we, we know is, uh, it, it has, has a number of welfare risk factors uh, because it is large and because it is wide-ranging. Uh, and, and look at the, the history of keeping the species within the UK. There's actually a long history. The first polar, captive polar bears were kept uh, 700 years ago. Uh, in, in, in the 1200s, 800 years ago, in fact, in the, in the, in the 1200s, uh, when the King of Norway gave uh, a polar bear to Henry III. And in fact, at that time, it was kept at the Tower of London, and this polar bear was attached to a large rope or chain and was, was allowed to swim in the Thames uh, and, and catch uh, uh, salmon. Now, moving forward to the more modern era, in the mid-80s, there were 11 facilities across the British Isles in, in the UK and Ireland uh, that kept uh, polar bears in uh, quite traditional polar bear facilities, such as the picture here at the London Zoo. And understandably, concerns were growing uh, amongst the public. And these triggered free uh, reports to be produced um, over the course of uh, a, a decade or so. And each of these reports uh, identified concerns, uh, produced recommendations, and they were produced absolutely with the cooperation of the industry. The research was taken out, uh, was undertaken in the zoos. It was a cooperation between uh, these NGOs, Born Free Foundation was involved in some of these reports. Uh, the UK government was involved. It had multi-agency cooperation. And there was an acknowledgement of the shortcomings and the issues relating to the keeping of polar bears in captivity. And as a result, there was a progressive decline of the number of polar bears kept uh, within British and Irish zoos reflecting those concerns. And then in 2007, uh, Club and Mason uh, produced a, uh, an analysis of 20 carnivores, uh, which showed that 
wide, being a wide ranging carnivore was, it was a big risk factor and polar bears being amongst the most wide ranging uh, were, were particularly susceptible. And by that time there was just one holder left in the UK and Ireland. That holder then moved that polar bear from a facility uh, that was less than 500 square meters to a much bigger, more expansive facility of 20,000 square meters um, and demonstrated that there was an alternative solution to simply phasing these animals out, that actually uh, it was potential, uh, it was possible uh, to deliver markedly better uh, uh, standards of well-being, but it requires an entirely different uh, methodology for doing so. Since then, uh, another holder has come on stream uh, in a similarly expansive facility, and we had the first captive birth uh, within the UK uh, uh, in, for 25 years in, in 2017. And essentially that social license uh, has been retained. So the way we keep polar bears in the UK now is fundamentally different, but it was that capacity to acknowledge uh, the challenges and respond to them that allowed um, that social license to be uh, retained. So if we look at the lessons in comparing these two uh, arguably quite similar species, the approach to, to the industry uh, in relation to concerns over orca were to defend the status quo and to resist change. There was actually very little movement in terms of facility design, etc., from when orca were first brought into captivity uh, to the point in which that social license was lost. The status quo was defended in terms of justifying uh, benefits to other species and benefits to the public and benefits to research. And I think this fails to kind of grasp the, 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 the public concern is all of this may be true and it may be good, but it's, it, it misses the point when the public concern relates to uh, uh, in individual animals. And in contrast, the concerns in relation to polar bears, those shortcomings were acknowledged. Uh, the, the industry was part of understanding those shortcomings and was also part of delivering that, that solution. And so uh, in, in contrast, uh, in relation to polar bears in the UK, uh, the sector embraced the challenge, it reacted uh, to it, uh, it didn't run away from it, uh, and, and, and ultimately that social license uh, was, was retained. I think we can still do better than this. I think the, the care of polar bears uh, in captivity at the moment, this, this isn't the end point, this is part of a progression. I believe we will continue to evolve and be, and be, be better. But to, to help deliver optimal welfare and help to defend our position, we need to get ahead of it. So it, the, the failings of the, the polar bear response is we were reactive as a sector. You know, we did react to growing concerns with the public. We want to identify those concerns before the public do. We want, um, we want to, to, to be ahead of the game. And I think we also want to be uh, more nuanced in our conceptions uh, of welfare to achieve that. Now, this is the first break for questions before I move on to the next section. So, yes, I will hand uh, over. thanks a lot, uh, Jake, for this first half of the presentation. That was super interesting. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Sally's computer has decided that it doesn't like Zoom. <laughs> so uh, right. we're going to have the help of our lovely colleague, Melissa Broadway. Uh, who will facilitate the questions. But just before she takes over, I would just like to remind you the time and it's already been uh, one hour. So just so that you are aware of this for the second half of the presentation. Thank you. Second two thirds. Oh, second two thirds. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I, I, I will try and rush through as quickly as I can, but we did start late. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I of course. It. No, I just wanted to remind you the time. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Melissa? 
been very interesting stuff. Thank you so much, Jake, for the first half. It's super engaging, super thought provoking. But we do have three questions for this uh, for this break, so I might just jump straight into them. Um, Julia, if you're there, do you mind turning on your microphone and asking Jake your question now? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Yes, can you yes. hear me? Wonderful. Okay, hi, Jake. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I had a question to the first slide you showed, actually, and that's one thing I always wonder. Um, I think you said that um, it, it was 45% or 54%, I think it was, um, of people considering that animals and zoos are happy. Um, now, that is like always with statistics you can turn around, and I was wondering, do you have a comparative number of how many pe people actually consider themselves happy in society? Because that's one thing I always think about is like, are we aiming at like everyone being perceived 24 seven as um, happy? Is that something that we have to face or can we say that 54% uh, of our visitors um, perceiving animals as generally happy in zoos, can that actually be um, considered a good result? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I think what I would say is, I, I mean, I'm certainly not happy with 54% of our visitors uh, thinking animals are happy is good enough. And I think if you were to ask those, you know, of, of those people who own pets, because I don't think it's appropriate to compare how we feel with how animals in a zoo feel. Um, and I think also, whilst I think your, your question's potentially confusing how often we feel happy with how much, I, I don't think it's the same as saying everyone thinks these animals are happy 54% of the time. I think it's 54% of the people think these animals are happy at some point. Um, but, I, so I, but I think a, a, a more appropriate comparison to that 54% is of those people, of those people who have pets, what percentage of those people do they think their pets are happy? Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it, that feels a more appropriate uh, comparison. And I think it's important to not confuse how often we feel happy as, in, as humans, as individuals, because you know, we, we undergo challenges and life isn't always perfect, but uh, that's not the same as the general public, as you know, roughly half of the people who visit us who think animals in zoos are, are, are unhappy? It's it's they're, they're not we're we're not comparing uh, a, a like for like comparison. Well, uh, what about uh, in wild in the wild? Do people perceive wild animals in the wild as always a hundred percent happy? Because I sometimes think that there's a very emotional uh, feeling about you know animals in the wild are always being happy and. Um, that might be also an approach to that. Do you have any numbers on that? Um, no, I mean this is this is this is an area that I'm particularly interested in, and clearly, and I, I'll go on to to talk about this in a bit more detail. I actually think captivity, if we do it right, has got the potential to improve on welfare experienced in the wild, but we need to approach it fundamentally differently and I, and I will talk about that in the next bit if, <laughs> if we have time um, but you, you're, you're absolutely right animals in the wild are, are routinely not happy but um, are, are, you know routinely face challenges but I think ethically society accepts that as just an inevitability of nature the un, when we take the decision to bring an animal into a captive environment, the unhappiness of an animal is not inevitable. And I think we, we stand on really dangerous ground by defending failings that we can and should address simply by saying, well, do you know what? It's not that great in nature as well. And I think that was one of the failings of the response 
uh, to concerns over keeping orca in captivity, to simply compare the longevity of an animal in captivity in the wild, saying, hey, look, everything's okay. They die as young in the wild as well. It's just, that's, that's not, that's not going to win us any favors or any arguments because we can and should address those challenges. But the challenges in nature are natural challenges and I think we need to view those entirely differently. Excellent. Um, yeah, that was a great thought provoking um, question and answer there. Um, if we do uh, ask the next two questions and you do plan to talk about them in the coming section, feel free to say, hold that question. I'll, I'll be bringing it up in a bit. But um, Hannah, if you're there, you had um, an interesting question about resources and things, if you want to jump in now. Yeah, brilliant. Hi, everybody. And it's great to hear your, um, your thoughts, Jake. Thank you. Um, I absolutely agree that, that we should be aiming to do more for welfare as an industry. Um, although I was, I was kind of curious because obviously a common theme that um, kind of keeps coming up that I see is that resource limitation impacts and quite frequently restricts welfare provision in various different ways. So obviously you've got, you know, the time, money and staff kind of um, issues, but also experience, motivation and understanding within institutions. Um, so I just wondered how would you like to see resource limitation challenged within the industry so that we can kind of push past this <clears throat> make more meaningful improvements for welfare? Yeah, th thanks for that, Hannah. So I, I think I will be talking about that. Um, basically, I think we need to be far more targeted in focusing on those aspects that deliver the greatest returns for welfare. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'm going to, what I will be talking about in, in, in the next section is, is how to identify, how to prioritize resources and actions to, to optimize welfare, because there's certainly a lot of things that we do that tip uh, various kind of welfare auditing metrics that don't necessarily optimize welfare. So I will be talking about that and it's a really good point. We have finite resources in terms of space and finances and we are frankly as a sector quite wasteful in how we deploy those resources in terms of you know targeted welfare improvement and so that's something I'm, i am particularly kind of passionate about and i will 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 hopefully touch upon cool awesome thank you perfect we can jump back to you hannah at the end if you've got any follow-up questions after that segment then anyway um all right well last question for this question time i'll throw to david david if you're there do you mind turning on your mic now uh, Jake, so this is uh, absolutely uh, the, the thing that I've been looking for. Uh, I love your presentation and, and the previous questions uh, really kind of lead into, um, I think, my question as well, because uh, obviously uh, resources and time to, uh, is a big concern with the, the data that you're collecting. And uh, I've been working with Dr. Isabella Clegg on trying to create a, a tool for that. But the data really is essential to kind of understanding the factors that most significantly measure like a high standard of animal welfare. And there's a lot of data that can be collected day to day. But in the end, you know, uh, how do we make the decisions on, on which of that data, this large amount of data that you might want to collect, if we can narrow that down to what measurements most significantly impact like a high standard of animal welfare, considering the number of species that we're trying to deal with, everyone's focused on megafauna, but I think clearly everyone would agree that we would like to eventually be able to establish uh, high standards of, of animal care and animal welfare for all species. Right, Th thanks David. I'm, I'm gonna talk about exactly that. So uh, essentially I'm a bit of a heretic within the animal welfare uh, science community because I think we've wasted a lot of time attempting to measure welfare. And I, 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 I say that not to say it's pointless, but it is fraught with challenges. It's, it's a difficult 
process to undertake. And by the way, I'm not suggesting we don't do it, but it, it, it is not, I believe, the, the, the panacea to, to, our, our, to moving forward. So it's fraught with challenges, which I hopefully very quickly touched upon. But crucially, in, in measuring welfare, we can only measure what is available at this moment in time. So if we're trying to determine what makes elephants happy, we can only review the welfare of elephants in the circumstances in which they're kept in. And what we need to do is to get better at not necessarily measuring welfare, but understanding what animals need. And they're not the same thing. Um, you know, how you measure, um, it's difficult to measure um, the importance of foraging for an animal that has no opportunity to forage, but there is a process to understanding how important foraging might be to that animal. And, and that's the, 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 the pivot I have taken in the past few years to pivot away from purely welfare assessment. And I do do welfare assessment and I'll, I'll give an, I'm going to give an example if we get time in this of an institutional wide welfare assessment. Uh, so it is something I agree with and advocate for, but I'm not entirely reliant upon it. And I think we need to get much better about understanding the needs. Uh, because that is the only way that we can kind of horizon scan and move beyond uh, the, the iterative paradigm that we've experienced so far where, oh, they've done a nice rhino enclosure, I'm going to make mine 10% bigger. Uh, to, to deliver the revolution in, in animal welfare that I think we need, we need to forget what everyone else is doing. Um, and we need to have a better understanding of what is important to the animal. And that comes back to Hannah's point. It's only by understanding what's important to the animal that we can effect, optimize and effectively deliver on the, the limited and finite resources that, that we have. So I, I hope if we get time and if people can stay on long enough, I'm going to cover those, those points in the, in the next bit. Okay, perfect. Well, I will just say as well um, that we are recording and uploading the session later. So if do, people do have to leave at some point and we are happy to keep going, um, then you can always catch up on the recording for the last bit of the section that you might miss. So we'll carry on then though, I think. Um, Jake, take it away. Thank you. Um, so, I think in, and again, following on from, from a lot of these questions, um, in terms of in, enhancing animal welfare in our facilities, we do actually face a choice as a sector in terms of where our emphasis lies, where we choose to focus the, the, the finite resources that, that, that Hannah mentioned, how much we deploy to health and how much we deploy uh, to um, the psychological uh, aspects uh, of welfare. Uh, and I now want to talk about that, uh, look about the relationship between these physical and psychological priorities in, in, in optimizing welfare, and to also look at some tools that I've, I've worked on developing over the past few years to help us op optimize that, that welfare delivery. So in relation to that choice, we need to consider that we, there is a spectrum of animal management. Uh, we have an intensive form of animal uh, management in which we retain control and we can protect animals from random events and physical stresses. And, and we control all of the inputs for the, the animal. We can monitor temperature, we can monitor food in and food out and we have absolute control and we can completely de-risk uh, uh, the animal uh, from uh, uh, random uh, events and, and, and physical harms by simplifying that environment and, and retaining that capacity to observe and, and, and intervene. And so the animal becomes heavily reliant upon human inputs 
at the other end of the spectrum. And again, these, this is a, a hill farm from the UK. These are also captive animals, but they're let loose uh, on the mountains for, for months at a time. And this is an extensive form of management in which the animals are more reliant upon their environment than they are on human inputs. Uh, there is less uh, capacity for humans to intervene. Uh, and these environments are typically bigger uh, and more complex. And we have similar situations within the zoo and aquarium sector. So uh, on, uh, on the left, we see a, a chytrid uh, secure facility for breeding amphibians. It's designed to protect uh, the physical health of, of, uh, uh, of these amphibians. And on the right, we could have exactly the same species maintained in, in, a, in a huge, expansive rainforest exhibit. They're definitely not going to get individual care. There's the potential that they might get predated. There's a potential that they might even get trod on uh, by the public. So there are greater risks associated with that extensive environment for this uh, zoo animal. Uh, but there are also greater opportunities for uh, uh, psychological opportunities for those individuals as well. And there is a continuum between uh, those two spectrums. And that's what I wanna talk about, about how we position habitat design and animal management uh, uh, along that continuum. Because I think if we can balance these two facets of animal welfare, we can be quite optimistic about what, what we're capable of, of achieving. So very briefly, it's worth noting that captivity can be great in protecting the physical health of animals. We can manage disease, we can eliminate predation, starvation, uh, about to say flood and fire, but there are obviously the occasional flood and fires in zoos. But by and large, we are great at de-risking uh, the lives, uh, lives of animals. We can manage aggression and we can treat injury. And typically for animals that are kept in captivity for any uh, reasonable period of time, typically they live longer in captivity than they do in the wild once we've uh, perfected uh, the capacity, uh, 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 our ability to to, uh, to protect their physical well-being. But captivity is left less good at safeguarding the psychological uh, well-being of animals. Animals experience behavioural restriction, they experience frustration, a lack of choice, uh, boredom, etc. And this is manifest in in in, in uh, many signs of that, such as stereotypic behaviours. Uh, which again, as this picture shows, rather than eliminate, we work around, we try and manage. Um, and so these psychological uh, deficiencies are real, they are apparent, and it, it's, it's, it's where we, we need to do better. And sadly, there is this inherent tension between uh, these physical and, and psychological uh, priorities. The more complex an environment, the greater difficulty we have in protecting uh, the physical uh, priorities, uh, but the, um, the greater the psychological opportunities for the animals. And there is this tension between the two. And I think as a sector, we're poor at finding that balance. We tend to focus on those aspects of, of welfare that are more measurable, which is um, why, uh, why I reference to, to, in response to David's question, we've become obsessed with measuring welfare and we've started managing welfare according to Im improving metrics relating uh, to our, our, me our, our measurement um, of welfare rather than actually delivering genuine welfare improvements to the individual animals. Um, and as a result, we fail to what I term as peak welfare, and that is a situation in which we can maintain the, the benefits that captivity affords that the wild does not afford uh, uh, animals in terms of that high degree of protection of physical well-being, while simultaneously providing for the psychological needs of animals. 
and it's important to understand and I'll talk about this, is we don't necessarily need to provide wild animals everything to be more confident about their welfare. But there are certainly key aspects of their, 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 their lives in the nature that we need to provide in captivity uh, to achieve this uh, peak welfare. And the missing ingredient in this has been the capacity to genuinely identify those psychological needs. And this is, this is fundamental uh, 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 to, to optimize welfare. So I wanna now just dig down a little bit more detail in, in regards to this relationship uh, between the physical and psychological components of welfare and, and the need for us to, to, to find bal balance. So under the intensive management um, uh, systems where animals are more reliant upon human inputs, we have the opportunity to monitor, we, have, we can regulate environmental stability, we can provide optimal healthcare or maximal healthcare, I should say, uh, you know, carefully managed and balanced nutrition, and we can obviously uh, uh, manage risk, risk reduction. And so this is the intensive environment that relies on human control and oversight, and it is ultimately requires less complex, more manageable environments in which the animal is more reliant upon human inputs than it is in the environment. Uh, and at the other end of the, the spectrum are an extensive management system all the way through to a, a wild situation where the environmental complexity is more appropriate to the, the species uh, evolutionary heritage. Um, it's, a pro, you know, and so the animal is more reliant upon its environment than it is on human inputs. There's more opportunity for choice, more opportunity for control, uh, and for the animal to do the things that it evolved to do. There are greater psychological opportunities. And there is this inherent tension between the two. The more complex the environment, uh, and, and a species appropriate complex environment that we provide animals, the more difficult it is for us to provide those physical safeguards. And the challenge we face is the benefits associated with the physical safeguards are more tangible than the benefits of the psychological opportunities. And that is why, for example, uh, these chow processed diets are fed uh, very widespreadly to um, carnivores in, in North America because the, the tangible benefits of balanced amino acids and body condition, et cetera, are, are very tangible and we can get a head around that. Whereas the slightly fluffier, more nebulous benefits of having the opportunity to eat a carcass, et cetera, uh, the, the, the two don't balance out because we've got the risks associated with eating that carcass of maybe it gets a parasite by maybe it gets a nutrient imbalance or chokes on a bone. These are tangible concerns and the benefits are less tangible. And as a result, uh, the zoo and aquarium sector, I think focuses its efforts uh, within that uh, physical uh, comfort zone. We're good at doing it, we're good at measuring it. And as a result, that's where we, we focus uh, our energies. But I actually believe on this continuum that welfare is likely to peak when we provide greater psychological opportunities and potentially sacrifice some of those physical safeguards. Um, and the reason for that is physical challenges to welfare are typically short-lived. If animals have uh, challenges to their physical health, they typically get better or they die. Challenges to an animal's psychological well-being can be lifelong. And because animals in captivity can live long lives, those compromises can be chronic. And so I think we need to shift the balance to prioritizing uh, those aspects that relate to psychological well-being, even if the benefits of that are, are, are more difficult uh, uh, to, to manage. Now, crucial to delivering this point of, of peak welfare 
is not simply creating the ultimate complex environment and sacrificing those physical safeguards. It's extracting the key elements from that environmental complexity that are relevant to that individual. And to do that, we need to be much better at identifying uh, the psychological needs of animals. And over the past uh, half decade or so, I've been working on, on a methodology for, for doing exactly that. And first of all, and so, and that's what I want to move on to now. Um, so I want to consider two very normal, natural behaviors. And again, I'll take you back to, you know, the five freedoms as a, you know, which has been arguably the most influential animal welfare framework for, for, for many, many years. Uh, and in, in there, there is um, uh, uh, one of the, the freedoms is the, the, the freedom to express normal, natural uh, behaviors. Now, both of these behaviors are normal. Both of these behaviors are natural. And I think intuitively we can see that it's potentially more important for a tiger to experience hunting behaviors, feed acquisition behaviors, than it is for a wild boar to experience being hunted in captivity. Um, and this illustrates that not all behaviors are equal. And so the tool I've been developing uh, over the past few years is a mechanism for us to, to actually quantify the extent to which behaviors and cognitive processes are important to animals so that we, we can prioritize finite uh, resources in terms of delivering that. And I'll give you, using this as an example, I'll very quickly walk you through uh, the process. So we look at uh, clues to help us identify um, the extent to which these behaviors are likely to be important to these animals in captivity. And this would be a, a, a fairly substantial talk of, in of itself. So I'm gonna have to you know, fly through this uh, fairly rapidly. But both of these behaviors are of high, high survival value. Um, it's important for a tiger to acquire food and it's equally important for a wild boar, in fact, more important for a wild boar uh, to evade predators. Anything that has a high survival value of, is of high evolutionary significance is gonna be highly motivated for when that behavior is triggered. If something is, and that's how, that's how evolution and behavior works, Evolution motivates behaviors that are of evolutionary significance to make sure they're expressed. So these are of high survival value, therefore they're highly motivated for, and therefore if animals are frustrated in their capacity to express these motivated behaviors, the welfare compromise is likely to be proportional uh, to their evolutionary significance. So, so far, both of these behaviors might be considered equally important. They're also equally, and I say equally, actually the predator escape is far more highly motivated and of more survival value because you get one chance to get a predator escape wrong, whereas you can fail in, in hunting and, and still survive. But nonetheless, they're both highly motivated for. In tigers, hunting and the foraging and the appetite behaviors associated with that are, are of longer duration. Uh, the, hunting the being hunted behavior is likely of short duration it's also irregular and typically infrequent and crucially um, evading a predator is triggered by the stimulus of the predator being perceived if we remove that stimulus the motivation to express that behavior never becomes manifest uh, whereas the motivation to go hunting and foraging comes from within the tiger itself. And so as a result, collectively, hunting and feed acquisition behaviors generally may be a need for captive tigers, but if we can remove the stimulus of boar um, being feeling like they are about to be predated, we can likely be very confident about not being concerned about uh, 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 wild boar expressing uh, predator escape behavior. And in fact, the absence of the expression of that behavior 
could actually be considered as a, as a metric of, uh, of improved welfare. And I'm sure some of you are thinking, you know, coping with stress, positive stress, there are benefits associated with that, which if we get time to talk about, we can. It's not as, as straightforward and black and white, but I think all collectively, we have an intuitive understanding that, you know, um, I, I managed a safari park for a decade or so. I didn't feel that those zebra who benefited from being in a social situation, mixed species exhibit, grazing opportunities to run, I didn't think uh, allowing the lions in the adjacent uh, uh, lion reserve into that habitat every uh, couple of months would have been enhanced their welfare. Uh, and so there is this spectrum in behaviors in terms of their, their welfare impact in captivity. And we need to get better at identifying that is because we don't need to replicate all of nature. And if we did, we would actually sacrifice some of the benefits associated with protecting um, um, physical well-being. And so the process of doing that and very conceptually is it, it relies on this relationship between the evolutionary significance of behaviors and cognitive processes, which is linked to uh, the, the strength of motivation when that behavior is uh, triggered, uh, which has that impact upon the, the psychological significance. So the more important it is for evolution, the stronger the motivation uh, there is when uh, that, that behavior or that cognitive process is triggered and the greater impact of that behavior being frustrated. Crucially, we have to consider the origin of the stimulus. If the stimulus is something that comes from within the animal, then that behavior or cognitive process is still gonna be motivated for in a captive environment. Um, whereas if it's a purely external trigger, uh, such as escaping a forest fire, which again is gonna be highly motivated when it's triggered, but if we can remove that trigger, we don't necessarily need to worry about the, its, its welfare significance. And the process also considers evidence of impact. So we look at uh, uh, welfare studies that have been undertaken and where there is data, and frankly, the data is, is quite few and far between, uh, but where it, it does exist, we do use that data uh, to, to, to inform the process. And so essentially what we do is we gather a panel uh, uh, of 12 experts, not I say 12, it's the 12 criteria that we set, assess each behavior and cognitive process by. And we gather an expert panel that's comprised of people with experience of the species in captivity and in the wild. Uh, and we undertake a, a, a review of each of the behaviors and cognitive processes that we consider by these 12 criteria that give us insights into these characteristically. And collectively, uh, that is assimilated by uh, a, a, an algorithm that weights each of the criteria. And it enables us uh, to produce uh, uh, a score for every single behavior and, and cognitive process. And I'm gonna give you three very uh, quick summaries of assessments that have been carried out uh, for three species. And in, in each of these three species, we've actually undertaken two assessments uh, to see the consistency of the scoring between uh, the different panels, just to, to, to kind of validate the consistency of the process. Uh, so this was carried out for Asiatic black bears and we, we worked with staff from the Animals Asia uh, Foundation to undertake this assessment. And we also did an assessment with postgraduate uh, veterinary students uh, from the Royal Veterinary College undertaking the uh, animal, uh, animal behavior and animal uh, welfare course at the Royal Veterinary College. And whilst these guys had no experience of the species necessarily in a captive or wild setting, we literally gave them the homework of going through every single reference on the species uh, that, that we could find. And what you can see is there's this very uh, strong correlation between the two outputs 
uh, and, and here we can start identifying those behaviors that are likely uh, important to that species. Similarly, we did one for Asian elephants and we compared um, the data from an assessment carried out, again, sponsored by Animals Asia that was carried out in Vietnam that had in situ experts and people who'd worked with Asian elephants in the wild. And we undertook an assessment with the EASA Academy uh, uh, one of the, on one of the welfare courses. Um, and again, uh, strong correlation. Interesting outlier here with processing food um, and from the, the zoo-based community uh, where they elevated the importance of processing food because it's used as an enrichment tool to increase the handling time. But again, uh, in terms of uh, the in-situ um, uh, expert panel uh, was not acknowledged to be as, as high a priority. So that, that is reflecting the different uh, backgrounds of the experts uh, and so when we do these as, ex, uh, these assessments we want to have a balanced panel between those with in situ expertise and those with ex situ expertise because both groups bring uh, you know different insights to the to the assessment but again as you can see despite the, the uh, differences in particular areas. Overall, there's actually a very strong correlation uh, between the assessments. And here's, here's one uh, that was carried out on Amur Tigers. Uh, and again, the, the, the interesting thing uh, about this one is that um, when we uh, ex excluded, there was a non-expert uh, uh, element taking part of this, but foraging emerged um, as uh, the most important behavior for, for an adult uh, tiger to, to undertake. And so, and there, there'll be a paper coming out on this in the next, the next few months, which I can share with Sally and she can forward on to you. Um, but the interesting thing about ammo tigers is, is evidently uh, the compression in their habitat is a major risk factor in terms of uh, welfare. But what we discovered through this assessment is that the solution is not necessarily simply providing a bigger enclosure, it's actually providing greater cognitive opportunities. So whilst compression of space may be a causal factor in the decline in welfare, it may not be uh, the, the solution. So I... Um, Melissa, I don't know if you want to have uh, the, another little break for questions there or just keep going through to the end. I think we might, we've just got one or two, but I think we might just save them till the end. I think we might just push through. That was some really good examples to think about for the next section as well. So um, I'll hand it straight okay. back. Yeah. Okay. All right. Th thanks, Melissa. So having... Um, in response to, to, to David's question, having kind of downplayed the measuring of welfare uh, and then provide, provided an alternative lens to look at improving welfare in terms of actually focusing on identifying welfare priorities, which incidentally can then be used to measure welfare. Ironically, I kind of developed this tool as the antidote to rely uh, an over reliance on welfare and assess assessment to move us forward because it's really hard to prove something causes, uh, you know, an, an absence of something is causing a problem to, 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 to a sufficient degree to uh, justify spending mil many millions of dollars on designing a habitat in a way that no one else has done before. Um, these welfare priorities can then become a metric by which you assess welfare. So if we identify the top 10 behaviors for this animal, we can then assess the capacity of the habitat and the management regime to provide uh, for, for, for that. So again, having kind of downplayed welfare assessment, I now want to talk about uh, exactly that, but perhaps at a slightly different uh, level more at a kind of an institutional level. So, and again, to Hannah's point, how can we prioritize resources on an institutional 
uh, wide basis uh, to, to move the needle uh, to the greatest degree in, in delivering uh, um, improvements in, in institutional welfare status. Now, assessing welfare is a real challenge. I've, I've touched on this a little bit. We don't measure welfare. We measure uh, welfare inputs, as I described them, which are the, you know, the opportunities of animals to express important behaviors. The physical well-being is important, despite all I've said. I'm, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's we need to view that in context. Uh, but equally important are things like social circumstances, the extent to which animals are empowered to move as they've evolved to move. All of these things impact welfare as it is experienced by the animal. Uh, but we also then measure uh, welfare output. So once again, physical well-being comes up. If animals are chronically stressed, it typically compromises their physical well-being, uh, the expression of abnormal behaviors and, and, and et cetera, et cetera, physiological measures uh, and so on. But these welfare measures are also affected by our perceptions, whether we're prioritizing the happiness of animals, and I defend the use of that, that word. I think we should kind of re-embrace that word uh, a little bit more. We shouldn't confuse it with their happiness, but I think actually animal welfare is about the happiness of animals. The, the emphasis that we put on, on animal health has an impact on how we uh, measure welfare. But I think it's also important to uh, consider public perceptions of welfare um, and you know, ultimately that, that does influence how they experience our, our institutions. So I'm gonna give you a really quick summary of an institutional uh, welfare assessment that, that I undertook. And again, no audit process is perfect. And when you're trying to get a snapshot of the welfare of uh, across an entire institution with 55 plus thousand individual animals, uh, you're certainly not addressing, uh, uh, assessing the welfare of individual animals. So in approaching this challenge, oh, Melissa, are you still, can you still hear me okay? Yep, you're still going perfect. Good. Sorry, I just got a, a note saying my internet connection was unstable, but okay. Um, so in, in assessing the, the welfare status of an entire institution, I thought it was important to look at it from these different perceptions. So I wanted to understand what the veterinary team, how they considered welfare uh, to be experienced by, by uh, the animals. I wanted to employ a, a more holistic approach that I uh, have used and developed over the years. The, uh, strongly reflects psychological elements of well-being in addition to the physical components. But I thought it was also really interesting to understand what visitors uh, perceive in relation to the, the health of our animals and the happiness of our animals. And that's how we, we framed the, the question for them. And we put all sorts of safeguards in place to ensure it wasn't just kids randomly pressing buttons, they had to answer a number of questions right for their, um, for their answers to be included in the data set. So on the holistic welfare audit, we looked at the extent to which we felt animals were able to express those behaviors that they were motivated uh, to undertake that were biologically important to them. And the, the holistic welfare audit was undertaken by any member of animal care staff who had uh, a year or more of experience working with that species and everyone was inducted into the process. So uh, they had a far more comprehensive induction into the, the assessment criteria than I'm gonna be able to give you today. We looked at aspects as of physiology and whether the environment uh, was predisposing animals to, to physical challenges, whether, whether there were routine clinical issues emerging. We looked at the social circumstances of animals, whether they're in appropriate social situations and whether they have that capacity to choose their uh, appropriate social situations and 
whether they were seasonal challenges or lifelong challenges. We looked at the, and again, it's quite a simple metric and one that a lot of zoos and aquariums really avoid kind of embracing. And that was the extent to which animals could reach their peak velocity within the habitat um, uh, uh, that the, 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 they live in, in their chosen form of locomotion. So if it's a bird, can it fly and can it fly at peak velocity? Um, for a, a given period of time. And we corrected all of this for, for body length because some animals could maybe re reach peak velocity, but could only do it for like, you know, one, you know, one or two body lengths. Uh, and then we looked for, you know, whether or not we were witnessing abnormal behaviors routinely or not within these habitats. The veterinary team and I allowed them to go away and develop their own criteria they looked at ease of emergency care, so if an animal's in trouble, how can they get in there and, and take care of that? Their ease of preventative care, so the management of clinical, you know, preventing clinical conditions uh, um, and morbidity and mortality rates. And again, with the public, we asked them whether the animals in this exhibit were happy and we asked them whether they were uh, healthy. And Obviously, this assessment is somewhat subjective, but actually welfare is a subjective thing. We are actually trying to assess the subjective experiences of animals. But when we start generating big data about these subjective uh, aspects or, or uh, 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 you know, expert insights on welfare, we start, it's, we start actually generating uh, more objective data. And if you're not aware of the uh, intelligence of crowds, um, this weird graph with a cow uh, on it, it shows that if you ask enough people how much a cow weighs, the average result is typically quite close to the actual result. And so by gathering big data and asking these, uh, uh, these asking expert people to, to answer these criteria, we start gathering data that I think, whilst it's not exactly the same as, as, as measuring body condition or longevity, it becomes increasingly uh, hard to ignore. And I think we, we would be wise not to ignore it. So uh, we, we, we undertook this assessment. We uh, gathered a huge amount of data, uh, actually 165,000 data points. Um, You'll see in the, can you, I don't, I'm not sure if you guys can see my cursor, but uh, each one of these uh, blocks in that middle, largely green column is an, is an individual enclosure. And each one of the columns within that are one of the five criteria. And each of the rows is an individual assessor. And they are asked to rank these uh, from one to five. And because it's, it's hard to kind of visualize all of this, we, we all, the, the, the algorithm that we have automatically allocates these scores of color. So we see some enclosures are consistently scoring greens across the board. Some are um, more reds and oranges, and some that we see, it's only a particular criteria that is consistently um, uh, um, sc scoring poorly. So like I say, this criteria here, uh, which was the first one, I can't even remember what that was. Uh, I think it was the behavioral uh, freedoms, the opportunity for animals to express important behaviors was scoring well for, for, for that species, but it was scoring less well for this criteria uh, and consistently so, which I believe was uh, the, the physical well being. So all of this data is then consolidated uh, from the various assessments, the, the veterinary assessment, the keeper assessment, and, and the visitor assessment. So we had three, four, four scores for every habitat within the facility. And the, the data, oops, 
seem to have lost. Oh, there we go. It seems to have jumped a slide. Let me go back one. So each one of these dots reflects uh, an individual habitat. And so what we see on the left hand side is the scoring derived from the keeper staff on this holistic welfare index ranked against the scoring provided by the, the, the veterinary team. And what we can see is exactly what, uh, and again, the, my conception that there is this tension between physical and psychological well-being uh, was produced before we did this analysis, but this appears to bear that theory out in that um, the greater the, the, the veterinary score um, for their capacity to deliver um, medical care and what they conceive good welfare to be about, um, uh, the, the lower the score for the holistic welfare index uh, uh, for the animals, which did include aspects relating to physical well-being. And so again, it's really important to understand Understand who it is we're asking questions about welfare because what our vets need to deliver good welfare is not necessarily what our animals need to deliver to experience good welfare. Our vets want simple environments, simple environments in which they get good observation and the capacity to intervene and get animals out and deliver treatment. The more complex mixed species exhibits, you know, you imagine treating. Uh, an individual clownfish in a huge expansive um, uh, coral exhibit. It's really difficult, but they, that will be providing the psychological opportunities comparable uh, 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 to, uh, to, to what the animal is, it would experience in nature and ultimately what it needs. So be really mindful who you're asking uh, about welfare status when you are expressing welfare. Uh, 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 assessing welfare. Now this is a really interesting one and I, and I mentioned this earlier. I think our visitors have a greater understanding uh, of, of welfare than we imagine and I think when we uh, when we can be a little bit pompous and look down on public concerns and say hey listen don't worry we're the experts. What this shows is that the visitors approval rating of the happiness of individual enclosures correlated very strongly with the holistic welfare index. Uh, and in fact, you, you could argue that the visitors have a greater understanding uh, of the, the welfare needs on a holistic scale than, uh, than the, the, the veterinary team at, at this facility. Now, there is a disconnect between visitor perceptions and, and the public, they do have some bias. It was evident in this facility that the capacity to provide for the welfare of high vertebrates was more challenging than it was for, for invertebrates, for example, and, and the public team uh, potentially had a, a, a more uniform uh, conception of welfare when it was broken down by taxa. But overall, visitor perceptions of welfare very strongly correlated with that holistic welfare assessment. And crucially, uh, in terms of the ongoing viability of us as an industry, the visitor's enjoyment of a habitat correlated very strongly with their approval rating of the, the happiness of those animals in that facility. And again, we corrected for people randomly pressing everything's fine here um, by we even switched the good side being on the left for enjoyment and the happiness side being on the right so they were having to move around the keypad and they had to get questions right so we, we went to a lot of effort to make sure this wasn't an artifact of, of, of simply uh, people pressing buttons. And crucially, what we were able to do for this facility in undertaking this broad spectrum holistic assessment and to, to respect the anonymity, confidentiality of the, the facility, I've, cr I've created this 
illustrative heat map, um, we were able to overlay the, uh, the, the welfare scores in a very um, easy to see, easy to understand metric um, that reflected the scores derived from uh, the animal care staff uh, that can then and should form the basis of, of a master planning priority where we see a cluster of red scoring habitats maybe that is the the area of the, of the zoo uh, that we should focus on first in, in moving our master planning forward um, so to, to close, just a, a few closing uh, comments before uh, you know, we move on to questions. I, I believe conservation is our mandate. Uh, it, it is what uh, the, the zoo and aquarium community must be about. But we have to consider animal welfare uh, as, as our license to operate. And if we fail to safeguard welfare, it has the, potentially, the potential to not just undermine our conservation uh, uh, objectives, but it, it can, on an institutional ba basis, lead to, to catastrophic failure. And I think we do have a unique role to play, but we need to, we need to be able to tick that welfare box to be effective uh, in doing so. And I think that unique role places us in a very special position. We have an opportunity to capitalize capitalize on the empathetic elements uh, and, and, and link that back uh, to conservation. That's something the WWFs can't do. We can bring people into our facilities, get them to fall in love with our animals and leverage that to, to switch them on uh, 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 to conservation. We need to be better at under, understanding uh, our institutional uh, status, welfare status, but let's be really careful about our conceptions of welfare because I think as a sector, we all too frequently uh, base our welfare metrics and conceptions around uh, those aspects that are measurable and, and coincidentally or, or not are, 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 are flattering to us. And again, let's just be aware that best practice might not actually be uh, uh, that great. If you have welfare concerns in your institution, don't wait on the welfare assessment to assume it's true. Assume they're real until proven otherwise. We often wait to prove there's an issue before we do anything. And I would like us to flip that off the head. If you have a concern, let's assume they're real until you can demonstrate they're not. Um, phasing out species you can't deliver good welfare on is not a failure. It's a sensible uh, strategy to take. We need to not be defensive. We need to be uh, aware of our constraints. But we do need to be mindful of double jeopardy species. The species that are wide ranging, uh, that are large, the iconic species, uh, are species that are often difficult to manage in captivity, but they are also species that have a very important role to play in captivity in terms of captive breeding. These species are often inherently rare and are also uh, in increasingly exposed to conservation risk. So there's these wide ranging species face a double jeopardy. They're at risk in the wild and they're at risk in zoos. And so we shouldn't turn our back on those, but we should, we should uh, look at novel ways uh, of addressing their needs and just be cognizant of, of those needs. And also, I think welfare is key to future proofing uh, zoos and aquariums and delivering on our conservation mission. Forget best practice now. Do not spend $20 million on your brand new, uh, you know, a, a facility that meets current best practice. Any institution that takes that approach is is uh, you know is ultimately doomed to be rebuilding that facility in a few years time let's base our designs and our understanding and our management upon the inherent needs of the animals which don't change over time they're products of millions of years of evolution and those needs of those animals are going to be consistent our understanding will will change and will evolve 
But if we base it on their inherent needs, uh, that's a far more sound starting point than simply looking um, at uh, what is going on within the industry. And ultimately, I think we should embrace the welfare challenge and not fight it. We need to work with uh, animal welfare stakeholders. They need to be seen as partners uh, in, in moving forward. Uh, and we need to work with them. And to do that, we need to be transparent. We need to be honest about our, our failings. So the, the, for example, the, the traffic light system that I developed there for this facility, I suggested that they were very open and honest about that and that they actually acknowledge that because like I say, in my experience, the, the public are perhaps more interested in the direction you're traveling than necessarily where you are right now. And I think that there's, there's a lot to be said for being open and transparent uh, uh, in, in relation to welfare, because I think that builds trust and that, that can only help us in the long term. And I will leave that there and hand over to Melissa and any other questions you guys might have. Yes, hi. Um, thank you so much, Jake. That was such a thought-provoking presentation. i so engaged. Um, I assume everyone else still here is um, being absolutely... How many, how many people are left? Because... <laughs> We've got, but we've got lots of people left. We've got oh, over good, two good. people here, so um, everyone. Thank you all for for, <laughs> for for staying on board. Yeah, no, it was fantastic. Um, so I might jump into the first question, because this is one that I was thinking about too. So Hannah, um, do you want to jump back in and ask Jake your question? Yes. Hello. Uh, that was awesome, Jake. Thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts. Really, really interesting. Um, like Melissa said, I've got a question that I think we both wanted to ask. Um, we were sort of thinking about um, basically wondering how can we do more as an industry to communicate the welfare and conservation work that we do? Um, and then secondly, do you think it would help if we could make welfare and conservation messages more relevant for individuals of the public? Um, and if so, how, how can we go about that really? Well, um, <laughs> you, you, you might have to jump in and remind me of aspects of the question that, that I'm gonna miss, but uh, I think, I, I, I hope I touched on it a, a bit. I think we need to be more transparent. I think, um, and, I, I hope what the presentation showed is we can't, you know, that we are the experts, but the the attitude of, you know, don't don't worry about this, we've got it under control, we're the experts, is 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 not a productive approach to be engaging with the public with. I think we have a duty to to help inform our public but we can't do that in a patronizing way and i think what the what the assessment at the uh the, the facility that i i, I described uh, earlier where we asked the public and we asked the keepers and we provided them a framework with which we extracted their knowledge of their animals and we also asked the, obviously the, the the veterinary team the public where that knowledge and insight comes from is, is hard to say. They're certainly not going out there and measuring welfare like we would, but I, I think they have an innate understanding. And I think we all do, you know, we can measure welfare and we can make assumptions and we can sometimes get it wrong. But by and large, I think that gut instinct people have about welfare is, is potentially on a population level is probably more accurate than we've considered in the past. And so I think we, it, it, we just need dialogue. We, and I, like I say, I'm, I'm a big fan for, you know, being open and transparent about like the, the journey the institution is undertaking. And, and um, I, I, I'm, I was keen to kind of have this traffic light system in the in the habitats 
whereby you know this is an area that is is marked for improvement and this is the area that we're going to improve and this is why we're going to focus on this area but i think there really is this synergy between the visitor experience and animal welfare we we, we showed here that people's enjoyment of a habitat is linked to their um, perceptions of welfare and I think when we start getting better at identifying what is important to animals we can start tailoring management and enrichment and habitat design around those needs which then become opportunities to talk to people about what's important to these animals which also provides us a platform to talk about the conservation challenges because if foraging is important to a tiger and these are the steps we're taking to provide those foraging opportunities in this space it also has relevance to its conservation in nature because they need to forage over the big areas and that's why they're endangered and that's why we need them here but we acknowledge that challenge and this is how we're addressing it so i think there really is that synergy between welfare conservation and in really engaging in the public in a, in a way that that turns something we're, we're almost scared of talking about into a positive um but it i think it needs a bit of a mindset change where we're just far more transparent and, and, and honest about the, the these issues with the public i don't know if that rambling kind of diatribe has, has, has answered your question or not um, <laughs> no that's really really helpful and yeah I, I share a lot of the same same sort of thoughts I wonder if do you um would you like to see any support like for institutions to be able to kind of go forward with this in terms of like you know limited resources or um you know though encouraging that transparent conversation would you like to see more support within the industry for the industry if that makes sense well i think to achieve that i mean i, I think you know for, for full disclosure my philosophy on this is not mainstream uh and, and so um and you know um to, to paraphrase a saying, opinions are like elbows, everyone's got one. Um, you know, I, I have an opinion and a perspective and it's how I've been managing facilities for two decades. And I think I've consistently shown that improvements in welfare have gone hand in hand with improvements in both conservation and the economic performance of facilities. But that's my individual experience. It, it's my approach but it's not necessarily broadly accepted by the industry. You know, like I say, the, the, the American Veterinary Medical Association is incredibly influential within AZA. Uh, um, vets are often referred to as, as the go-to source on, uh, on, on animal welfare. And so, yes, I think there should be more institutional uh, support in optimizing our resources but you, what again just what you should be aware is what i'm kind of proposing here is not yet mainstream i i, I hope it will get there at some point um uh, but i think we're a, we're a long way from it being mainstream and therefore you know, for the likes of the ERs or etc to provide that type of institutional support um could be challenging and maybe uh you know melissa could could maybe chip in on 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 that as well sorry for putting you on the spot there melissa but no i think it's um i think it's really important um and transparency in communications with the wider public is definitely something um that is seen we see as beneficial Absolutely, and it's opening that dialogue to get the conservation message through. Um, obviously, uh, hiding away from um, potential welfare uh, issues that do arise, I don't think builds that same level of trust. So I think in terms of uh, opening the dialogue, creating platforms such as this one, where lots of people can join and join in the discussion and talk about these um, 
really interesting and thought provoking topics and different approaches on how to um, move forward with animal welfare in our institutions and things is super beneficial. And I think that perhaps might lead me on to my question that I had for you as well, Jake, in terms of um, the approach that you identified in looking at welfare priorities for the animal and how you had that really interesting study with in situ and ex situ um, experts that were able to identify the needs of the elephants, for example. Um, a really interesting approach and uh, I think super insightful um, for those institutions and things that might want to replicate this for different species but might not have the necessary um, contacts in, in, in the um, in situ environments and things like that. Would you just recommend taking a similar approach, but getting as many people involved as possible? Is more so, of research the answer? What do you think? Well, the, the 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 tool that I've developed, and it's it's kind of evolved over the course of uh, you know seven or eight years. In fact, is it's actually it's been ref it's gone through a whole number of iterations. And it's quite a complex and nuanced process. And so I would absolutely encourage institutions to consider what's important to behave to animals in the wild from an evolutionary perspective and to consider where the motivation for those behaviors come from and whether those motivations are going to be pr present in zoos. But Unfortunately, the, the downside of this process is it's complex, it's nuanced, it's quite labor intensive. And one of the concerns we, we have about it is if it's kind of randomly undertaken by people who don't necessarily fully understand the process, we start getting multiple assessments using the same tool for the same species that have different outcomes that potentially undermine the confidence people have in the assessment. So the approach we're taking with this is we want to keep um, control over the quality of the assessment, um, but we want to make the output of the assessment open access. So each time we, we do an assessment, we, we are aiming to publish that. I think it would be great if these assessments were routinely incorporated into husbandry guidelines, even if it's just as a reference point. Well, crucially, what we're doing is, we're doing these assessments and not then not going and telling people how to manage their animals. We're saying, this is what's important. These are the things that you need to think about. And then allowing individual zoos or the industry to go away and start problem solving based around the, the needs of animals. So in general terms, absolutely. Think about the origin of the stimulus and the evolutionary significance of the behaviors and the cognitive processes. For these assessments, you know, we're trying to make them available to any institution that wants to undertake them. And if you're building a big expensive habitat, I think this is absolutely the ground zero of that design process. The animal is the client, it's not the zoo, it's not the visitors, it's the animal that's gonna be there 24 hours a day. Let's understand what the animal needs from that habitat so that we can spend that money wisely, coming back to Hannah's point, optimizing those finite resources. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, we want to make those outputs uh, 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 open access. So I don't know if that answers your, your question, Melinda. No, no, absolutely. That's, um, that's really good that you're making them open access because I think that they're super, super useful for the industry as a whole and absolutely to be incorporated into best practice guidelines and things like that. Um, I think we've just got time for probably one more question that came through quite a lot in the uh, registrations and kind of links back to where you're talk you were talking about when if you focus on the physical aspects of the environment in containing that you uh, reduce the availability for environmental complexity and choice within the environment um, we weren't 
um, a lot of registrations were wondering how do we prioritise more choice in the environment and do we need to link this necessarily back to those behaviours that were the most important to the animal um, in the areas that we provide more choice or should we aim to do that as a general overview for the whole environment for the animal? Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, this is where we really need to be be careful because I've seen presentations at conferences where you know um, complexity and choice are put forward as as good things, and and they are, but they are up to a point, and the degree of complexity and the degree of of, of choice and the nature of that complexity and the nature of that choice needs to be tailored to the individual so if we take a giant salamander it doesn't want a complex environment mm -hmm. it doesn't want a great deal of its environmental stability and to kind of bombard with you know environmental complexity and lots of choices isn't necessarily improving its welfare so absolutely everything does come back to tailoring the principles to the needs of the individual animals and, and complexity and choice is a shorthand you know because the more complex environments typically the more opportunities for choice and are typically you know the more appropriate they are going to be for the animals psychological needs but only if that environment is the right one you know sticking uh you know to, to give a ridiculous example um Coral reef is a complex environment that would offer lots of choice, but it's not the right complexity and it's not the right choices for an elephant. And that's a ridiculous example, obviously, but the complexity and choice needs to be optimized and tailored to the individual animal's needs, which brings us back to identifying what those needs are. So the, the kind of the takeaway from this is how, how we've been approaching welfare is i think too much shaped by how we measure welfare and we have to kind of step back from that and get better at understanding the needs of animals which whilst that can use insights from how we measure welfare is not tied to it because it, it, that that limits our palette of information too much and then we need to kind of optimize that tension and that relationship based on that uh, improved understanding of the, of the needs of animals. Um, so it's not about maximizing, it's about optimizing. It's not about let's, you know, maximize the amount of choice and complexity. Let's tailor that complexity and tailor those choices to the needs of them. Yes, sorry, um, you just, for the last two seconds there, your internet just went a little bit funny, but we got, um, we got the answer for that question. So that was brilliant, thank you. All right. Um, and I did lie, I said there was, that was the last question, but we just do have one more from Camille <coughs> we might try and squeeze in. So Camille, sure. would you have, be happy to jump on the microphone now, thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Jake. It's very interesting. Um, I do have a question. I would like if you could touch on um, the needs of animals in their outside enclosures, the ones that are visible to the public, um, versus the ones that are, you know, non-visible to the public or the nighttime enclosures, because I find that there's a lot of, yeah. you know, emphasis on the ones that are visible to the public and the ones that are not are often, you know, very sterile and uh, forgotten about and they spend you know big carnivores spend a lot of time on in their inside enclosures at night and uh, if, if you could just touch on that that would be interesting thank you yeah for sure and again um, I think this kind of picture sort of touches touches a little bit on um, your point it, like it, it's important that the public 
see that we're delivering good welfare, but that doesn't mean to say the welfare of animals doesn't matter when they're not being viewed by the public. You know, it's not, it's not quantum animal welfare. It's not only relevant uh, or, or meaningful when someone's looking at it, it's meaningful all the time. So absolutely, um, we need to consider the welfare of the, the animal's existence in our facility and in, in its entirety. And I'm gonna, if I can, Melissa, I'm gonna merge this with one of the questions that Gabrielle Harris brought on about um, interactions and, and program animals, because I think they are a group of animals uh, uh, suffer in inverted commas as a result of this, exactly this issue the most. There's the experience the public see of this uh, apparently happy, playful animal that they're interacting with. But what they often don't see is the housing that that, that, that animal um, is, is kept in for, for long periods of time. And like I say, working on the basis of transparency, just because public can't see it, we have to work this that it, it's, it's just as important as what they do see to the public. I mean, you know, we, we live in a, an age, obviously, with social media and mobile phones. There, there is no such thing as a secret anymore. Uh, and so um, even if we're not inherently motivated to deliver 24 hour high standards of welfare, which of course we should be, and I, I'm sure everyone simply by attending this meeting is, is part of that group. But um, just because that, the public can't, can't see the animals um, uh, environment and, and conditions doesn't mean that so, we shouldn't give it equal or if not more attention because often they spend more uh, uh, time uh, in, in those facilities than they do on exhibit. And in fact, I, I was a part of a, an accreditation team that reviewed one of the most beautiful zoos anywhere in the world. It's a brand new facility and the habitats were just stunning absolutely stunning but to protect these habitats the animals are only on the habitats when the visitors are on site and the offshore facilities were frankly shocking and this was a brand new facility and so we we at your you know thank you for for, for mentioning uh that question camille we need to give equal priority to to the needs of animals when they're off shows to, as to when they're on Okay, what an excellent point to um, wrap up with, I think. Uh, so firstly, I just want to say thank you so much, Jake, for that presentation. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, like I kept saying, very thought provoking and something to really take forward with us um, in all of our different institutions. And um, so thank you so much again. Thank you for all the participations that are uh, participants that joined us today. Um, I know we went a little bit over, but um, just, that's just going with the theme of all of our welfare webinars so far. They're just too engaging and um, so we always tend to run over, but we all have a great time doing so. Uh, we will be posting the recording um, to our Facebook page and the EASA YouTube channel, as Sandrine mentioned, and we will be sending around a notification when that recording does go up as well. If you do have any questions for Jake that you don't think were answered during uh, the webinar today, please do feel free to email Sally. Um, Sally's been emailing the agendas through and things like that, so you should all have her email address and she can help pass those along to Jake as well. Um, but other than that, I might just throw it back to you, Jake, and if you wanted to say anything before we wrap up. Yeah, well, well, to all those uh, people who managed to stay in for the long haul, and uh, like I say, we do want to make these assessments um, open access. Um, so um, if anyone is looking to learn a bit more about a particular species in their facility and wants to, to be part of one of these assessments, feel free to contact me. We can, uh, we're looking at trying to make these happen uh, virtually. Uh, 
Um, but it's going to help us build up this database of assessments that we want to be out there in the public domain. So if you've got a, a, a species uh, that you're concerned about or a new facility you're looking to develop and you want to kind of prioritize uh, those resources to optimize your welfare, um, you know, let me know and I'll see if I can help you out on that. Excellent. All right. <laughs> well, thank you again, uh, everybody, for attending. Jake, you have received an enormous amount of positive comments in the chat. So uh, I think I speak on behalf of everyone when um, I say brilliant presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Melissa, for um, jumping in. And um, I know that Sally is apologizing to everybody for uh, the little technical issue. But we will be seeing you at the next webinar, hopefully, that will be announced soon. So please follow us on Facebook for the latest uh, news and for um, the recording. I would just like to say goodbye, everybody. Have a nice evening or day. Um, I'm not sure where you're joining us from. And I will kindly ask you to please exit the meeting room, except for Jake, please, and Melissa. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you.